Do you know what bugging in means and how it might save your life? It's about turning your home into a safe haven when chaos strikes. I'm speaking from experience here. After a fierce blizzard trapped my family and I inside for a week, no power, no heat, no access to grocery stores. That's when I realized how vulnerable we were. Bugging in isn't about fear. It's about readiness. It's about turning your home into a sanctuary where you can handle any disaster. Your home is your first line of defense. It's your castle. And like any castle worth its salt, it needs to be fortified. First things first, secure your perimeter. Lock all your doors and windows, including the garage. Draw those curtains and shades. We're not trying to play peekaboo with anyone. We're just not advertising what we have inside. You should also have defense equipment ready. I'm not suggesting you turn your home into a personal armory, but having a few essential items can make a world of difference. Something as simple as a sturdy baseball bat can be a formidable weapon in the right hands. But if you're comfortable with firearms and your local laws allow it, then a firearm can provide an extra layer of protection. Remember though, these are tools of last resort. We're aiming to deter, not engage in a full-blown medieval battle. Pay special attention to your home's layout. Identify a safe room, a place where you can retreat if things go south. Ideally, it should be an interior room with no windows facing the outside. Remember, bullets can travel through walls, so choose a room that offers the most protection. This room should also be well insulated to help you maintain a comfortable temperature and minimize noise. Make sure there are no gaps around the doors or windows where light can escape, helping to maintain secrecy. This safe room could be your last line of defense, so make sure it's well equipped. And let's not forget about fire safety. Make sure your home's exterior is free from flammable materials like overgrown bushes or leaning trees. Having a clear fire break around your house can prevent a small fire from turning into a major disaster. Have fire extinguishers, smoke alarms, fire blankets, and even gas masks readily available. You never know what kind of situation you might find yourself in. Take a walk around your property with a critical eye. What vulnerabilities do you see? Are there easy access points for intruders? Weak spots in your fence? Fix them. Now's not the time to discover your climbing roses also double as a handy intruder ladder. Designate specific rooms for different purposes. Close off unused areas to conserve energy. If you're worried about chemical or radiological contamination, seal off vents and fireplaces in those rooms. Don't forget to create a makeshift decontamination station near the entrance of your home, with a designated area to remove and dispose of contaminated clothing. Don't forget about your upper floors. If you have a two-story home, take turns checking windows for any disturbances. Utilize a buddy system so no one has to stand guard alone. Remember, your home is more than just bricks and mortar. It's your sanctuary your stronghold. Treat it as such by taking steps to make it as secure and defensible as possible. Moving on to something a little less glamorous, but equally important, sanitation. I know it's not the most exciting topic, but trust me, it's a game changer when it comes to survival. Picture this, you're hunkered down in your bug-in fortress. The world outside is a chaos of wind and rain. You've got your food, your water, and you've secured your home. But what about the little things like you know, going to the bathroom. It's not something we often think about when planning for a disaster, but it's absolutely crucial. I learned this the hard way during that same blizzard I mentioned earlier. When the power went out, so did our sanitation system. Let's just say it was a few days of creative solutions that I'd rather forget. But it taught me a valuable lesson. Sanitation is non-negotiable. So how do you handle this delicate matter when the world outside goes haywire? Well, First things first, let's talk about flushing. If your municipal power is gone, don't panic. That toilet tank of yours is a mini reservoir, holding about two gallons of precious liquid. Use it wisely, and if that runs dry, your water heater is a backup plan. It can store anywhere from 20 to 100 gallons, but let's be real, those resources won't last forever. That's where our old friend the garbage bag comes in. Line a five-gallon bucket with one, add a lid, and voila, you've got a makeshift toilet. Just remember, keep it sealed tight when not in use. You don't want any unwanted visitors, like, you know, the creepy crawly kind. Let's also talk about waste disposal in the long term. If you're planning to bug in for more than a couple of weeks, 
you'll need to dig a latrine. Aim for a depth of at least two feet and keep it a good distance away from any water sources, like streams or wells. We don't want to contaminate our precious drinking water, right? Here's a good rule of thumb. At least 200 feet away from all natural water sources is a safe bet. But sanitation isn't just about toilets and waste. It's also about personal hygiene. Keeping yourself clean can help prevent the spread of diseases, especially when you're in close quarters with others. Here's where baby wipes become your best friend. They're a great way to stay fresh when you don't have access to a shower. And speaking of showers, if you have a bathtub, you can use it for sponge baths. Just be sure to ration your water for this. There's one thing that keeps you going when the world outside goes crazy. Food. I mean, let's face it, a cranky, hungry person is not the best company in a crisis. During that blizzard, we were running low on supplies, and let me tell you, the mood in the house was not pleasant. We were all irritable and short-tempered. That's when I realized the importance of keeping everyone well-fed and hydrated. Food is obviously one of the most important items you can have. The key is to have a good mix of staples that are easy to store and prepare. Think beans, rice, pasta, canned vegetables, and dried fruit. They're packed with nutrients and can last a long time. Don't forget about protein. Canned tuna, salmon, or chicken are great options. Cooking during a crisis is a bit of a challenge. You want to avoid anything that's going to attract unwanted attention, like a smoky campfire. Camping stoves and solar ovens are great alternatives. They're efficient, low-profile, and can help kill bacteria in your food and water. But even with a camp stove, fuel can run out. Here's where a little ingenuity comes in. You can improvise a camp stove using sterno cans and bricks. There are plenty of tutorials online that can show you how. Let's keep things simple. The less you rely on external resources, the better. It's not about roughing it for the sake of it, but about making smart choices that keep you safe and comfortable. And remember, a little comfort goes a long way. Having a few of your favorite snacks or treats stashed away can boost morale. Think about it. A small bar of chocolate or a bag of your favorite chips might seem insignificant, but in a time of crisis, it can be a real pick-me-up. But food is just half the battle. You also need to think about variety. Let's face it, nobody wants to eat the same thing every day for weeks on end. Here's where a little creativity comes in. Invest in a good cookbook that features recipes that require minimal ingredients and can be prepared without electricity. You can also get your family involved in planning the menu, and it's a great way to keep everyone engaged and positive. And don't forget about the little things that make a meal special. A sprinkle of your favorite spice, a drizzle of hot sauce, or even a dollop of jam can take a simple dish from bland to delicious. Here's another tip. Portion out your spices and condiments into smaller containers. This will save space and prevent spoilage. Moving from food, let's discuss the lifeblood of survival water. It's not just about quenching your thirst, it's about cleaning, cooking, and staying sane. I mean, have you ever tried to brush your teeth with a dry toothbrush? Not fun. Let's circle back to the blizzard I mentioned earlier. I remember that the power was out for days, and so was the running water. We were lucky to have some boiled water stocked up, but it ran out quickly. We ended up melting snow for washing and boiling water for drinking. Let me tell you, it was a real eye-opener. It made me realize just how much we take water for granted. So, how do you prepare for a water crisis? Well, first, think like a squirrel and gather your nuts. In other words, fill every container you can find. Sinks, bathtubs, even pots and pans can become temporary water storage tanks. And don't forget about collecting rainwater. If you have a garden, set up rain barrels or other rainwater harvesting systems. Every drop counts. Here's a little math trick. A standard rain barrel can collect up to 50 gallons of rainwater from a single downpour. That's a lot of free water. Aim for at least a gallon of water per person per day. That might sound like a lot, but it covers drinking, cooking, and hygiene. And remember, quality over quantity. Not all water is created equal. If the water supply goes out and then comes back on, it's best to assume it's contaminated. Boiling is a good way to purify water, but it's not always practical, especially if you don't have a working stove. Invest in a good water filter or purification tablets. They're small, lightweight, 
and can be a lifesaver. Here's another option. Consider a water purifier straw. They're portable and allow you to drink directly from questionable water sources. Here's a tip I've learned through my years of experience as a prepper. Teamwork makes the dream work. Talk to your neighbors, share information about the situation. You might find that someone has a well or a generator that can help you out. And if you have extra supplies, be willing to barter. We're all in this together. Securing your water supply is one of the most important steps in emergency preparedness. It's not just about having enough water, it's about having safe water. So take the time to plan, collect, and purify. Your future self will thank you. In a bug out situation, you might be cut off from the world. No news, no updates, just silence. Scary, right? That's why communication is key when it comes to surviving a crisis. It's like having a lifeline to the outside world, a way to get help, information, and support. When we lost power during the blizzard, we also lost our phones and the internet. It felt like we were on a deserted island. We had no idea what was happening outside our neighborhood. It was terrifying. So what did I learn from that? Well, I experienced firsthand how important it is to stay connected. First, invest in a good old-fashioned battery-powered or hand-crank radio. It's your window to the world when everything else goes dark. Listen for weather updates, news bulletins, and emergency instructions. And don't forget to keep a stash of batteries. Next, create a communication plan with your family and friends. Decide who to contact in case of an emergency and how you'll get in touch. Write down important phone numbers and addresses. And remember, cell phones might not always be reliable, so have backup plans. Establish check-in times. Decide on specific times to call or text each other to let everyone know you're okay. It might sound simple, but it can be a huge relief to hear from loved ones. And if phone lines are down, don't panic. There are other ways to communicate. Social media platforms can be a lifeline, but remember, battery life is limited. Text messages are often more reliable than calls. Teach your kids how to use a landline phone. It might seem old fashioned, but it can be a lifesaver if the power grid goes down. Remember, communication is a two-way street. Not only do you need to be able to receive information, but you also need to be able to share it. If you know something important, let others know. You might save someone's life. Staying connected might seem like a small thing, but it's a big deal when it comes to survival. It's about staying informed, staying connected, and staying calm. Mental health might seem like a luxury when you're facing a crisis, but trust me, it's essential for your overall well-being. I mean, have you ever tried to solve a problem when you're stressed out and overwhelmed? It's not pretty. That nasty blizzard had us all on the brink of madness, not even exaggerating. The kids were bored out of their minds, my wife was constantly looking for ways to get news updates on the storm, and I was worried about everyone's safety. It felt like a pressure cooker ready to explode. But then we pulled out the old board games, dusted off that deck of cards we never use, and even started writing silly stories together. It was amazing how quickly our moods changed. A little laughter and lighthearted competition went a long way in diffusing the tension. So, how do you stay sane when the world around you is falling apart? Well, first keep your mind occupied. Stock up on books, games, puzzles, or whatever keeps you entertained. Having something to focus on can help take your mind off the anxieties swirling around you. Here's a tip. Gather supplies for different interests. If you enjoy reading, collect a variety of books, including fiction and nonfiction. Board games are a great way to connect with family and friends, so choose a variety that cater to different ages and interests. And don't forget about creative outlets, Coloring books, sketch pads, and musical instruments can be a great way to relax and express yourself. Staying connected with loved ones is also crucial. Talk to them, share your feelings, and listen to theirs. It's amazing how much better you feel when you know you're not alone. And here's the little secret. Laughter is the best medicine. Watch funny movies, tell jokes, or just goof around. It might seem silly, but it can do wonders for your mood. Laughter releases endorphins, which have mood-boosting effects. Plus, it can help you take a step back from the situation and see things in a more positive light. Remember, taking care of your mental health is just as important as taking care of your physical health. It's about finding ways to cope with stress, stay positive, and maintain your resilience. A healthy mind is better equipped to handle the challenges of a crisis. Let's move on to the less glamorous side of preparedness, finances. I know it's not as exciting as survival gear and bug-out bags, but trust me, it's just as important. 
So let's start with the basics, cash. I know it's old school, but having some cold hard cash on hand can be a lifesaver when ATMs and credit card machines are down. It might seem inconvenient to carry around a bunch of bills, but it's worth it for peace of mind. Trust me, there's nothing more frustrating than having a wallet full of plastic when you need it most. Pay attention to your insurance. Review your homeowners, renters, and auto insurance policies to make sure you're covered in case of disaster. Take the time to understand your policy, including deductibles and coverage limits. And don't forget about flood insurance. Even if you don't live in a flood zone, it's worth considering. Natural disasters can be unpredictable, and it's better to be safe than sorry. Let me give you some advice that might come in handy. Keep your important documents in a safe place. This includes insurance policies, birth certificates, social security cards, and any other essential paperwork. Consider creating digital copies and storing them in a secure cloud-based system. That way you'll have access to them even if your physical files are damaged or lost. Remember, financial preparedness is about more than just having money saved. It's about being prepared for the unexpected and having a plan in place to weather the storm. By taking the time to organize your finances and protect your assets, you're taking a big step towards building a resilient future. So let's imagine that the big one hits. The power's out, the trees are down, and your world is turned upside down. It's a scary time, but remember, you've prepared for this. You've got your supplies, you've got your plan, and now it's time to put it into action. The first step after the storm is to assess the damage. It's like being a detective, investigating the crime scene that used to be your home. Look for structural damage, broken windows or leaking roofs. Check for gas leaks, electrical shorts, or any other potential hazards. You don't want to get hurt while trying to clean up. Remember, safety first. Don't rush into anything. If you're unsure about something, don't hesitate to call for help. And always listen to the instructions from local authorities. They're the experts, and they know what they're doing. Once you've assessed the situation and ensured everyone is safe, it's time to start the cleanup process. But that's a whole other story. Take it slow, prioritize the most critical tasks, and don't be afraid to ask for help from your neighbors, friends, or family. Working together as a community is essential in the aftermath of a disaster. Here are some additional tips for staying safe after a disaster. Be aware of your surroundings. Watch out for downed power lines, damaged buildings, and other hazards. Make sure to wear sturdy shoes and gloves to protect yourself from debris. Also, be cautious when using generators or other gasoline-powered equipment. Carbon monoxide poisoning is a serious risk. Make sure you only drink clean water. Boil tap water for at least one minute before consuming it. Take care of your mental health. Disasters can be stressful, so it's important to find healthy ways to cope with the aftermath. Talk to loved ones, seek professional help if needed, and focus on self-care. So the initial shock of the disaster has worn off, and now it's time to roll up your sleeves and start rebuilding. It's like putting together a giant puzzle with missing pieces, but with a lot more stress and a whole lot less fun. Remember that blizzard I mentioned? After the initial shock wore off, we were left with a mess that looked like a bomb went off. Trees were down, the roof was damaged, and there was glass everywhere. It was overwhelming, but we knew we had to start somewhere. The first thing we did was document everything. We took pictures of the damage from every angle. We wanted to have a record of everything for insurance purposes. It might seem like a hassle, but it's worth it in the long run. Trust me, insurance adjusters love pictures. And while we were snapping photos, we also made a list of everything that was damaged or destroyed. This helped us keep track of what we needed to replace and gave us a starting point for our insurance claim. It might feel like a lot of paperwork, but it's essential for moving forward. Once we had a grasp of the situation, we looked out for help. We contacted our insurance company to file a claim and started looking for contractors to help with the repairs. We also reached out to friends and family for support. It's amazing how quickly people rally around you in times of need. Remember, recovery is a marathon, not a sprint. It's going to take time, patience, and perseverance. But with each step forward, you'll be one step closer to rebuilding your life. And remember, you're not alone. There are resources available to help you through this process. Reach out to your local disaster relief organizations. They can provide assistance with everything from temporary housing to financial aid. So, take a deep breath, take it one day at a time, and don't give up. 
Speaking of surviving inside your home for an extended period of time, we've made a comprehensive video on how to survive the first 100 days after the collapse. Click the video on screen now, because this is information you wouldn't want to miss out on.